Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron, please check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. Please support the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media. Take action now and become one of them. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website. All female patrons, $5 and above, are invited to join the closed Facebook group, the Tough Girl Tribe. Today, I'm absolutely delighted that we're going to be speaking to Dr. Stacey Sims, who is the author of Raw, How to Match Your Food and Fitness to Your Female Physiology for Optimum Performance, Great Health and a Strong Lean Body for Life. Hi, Stacey. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing well. Despite living in New Zealand, no, I do not have a New Zealand accent. (laughs) Where is your accent from? Um, I'm originally from California. Oh, nice. When did you move to New Zealand? Uh, This time around, about three years ago, but I've been back and forth for around, dare I say, 20 years. So, Stacey, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and to tell everybody a little bit more about who you are and how you would introduce yourself. I am an environmental exercise physiologist and nutrition scientist that specializes in sex differences. And the best way to describe it is looking at exercise in hot and cold conditions and how women respond versus how men respond and how to tailor interventions and nutrition and recovery to the two different sexes. Oh my God, I love it. Absolutely amazing. Before we get into sort of uh, how you got into into your academic life, I'd love to go back to your childhood and find out more about life for you growing up. Were you sporty? Were you outdoorsy? You know, what was your childhood like? Um, I was an army brat, so I grew up all over the place and I was the youngest of two. So I liked to go outside and play and build tree houses and run around while my sister was inside either reading books or talking on the phone. Um, sometimes she'd come out and couldn't find me because I was hiding from her. But basically, because we moved around so much, just trying to find friends to play with every time you PCS and got someplace new, and the best place to do it was outside playing. So that kind of evolved my love for being outside and playing and sport and, and such, and got into dancing when I was really young, and also found running about the same time and was told when I was about 13, I need to choose between the two and was recommended running would be the way to go because I was getting too tall and gangly. Uh, and so I pursued the running angle and dropped the dancing angle and just started getting more and more into endurance. So when I was in high school, uh, running cross country, I was in the inner city part of San Francisco and really trying to understand like how you feed yourself. And when you drive down the I-5 that goes between San Francisco and LA, you smell the feed lot. So the full on like cow factory farming is just awful. And that really turned me on my head going, whoa, what is going on? And started looking into the sustainable, all the buzzwords now, sustainable agriculture and that kind of stuff, which drove my interest into food. And so as I started rolling through the years, started looking at, okay, what's good for me? How do I nourish myself? How do I get the most out of training? And then through the academic aspect, getting told, well, you know, women are anomalies. This isn't right. Your data is just a, you know, just something that we have to factor in. And at the same time, being an athlete going, well, how is that possible when this whole group of women that I'm racing with and competing with and my teammates were all doing something that's supposedly an anomaly. So that started driving the academic questions of why are women different? Why do we need to train differently? Why do we need to eat differently? And being thrown back going, well, you know, we have this four week training program that everybody has to do. And you, everyone has to drink X amount. and Everyone has to eat X amount. I'm like, wait a second. I'm a 60 kilo woman and I'm standing next to an 80 kilo guy. And you're telling me we have to do the exact same thing. Uh, So all of those intrinsic questions of why, why, why has kind of pushed me through both my sport and academic career. Oh, my God. Absolutely fascinating. So 
with the with the academic and and being an athlete when did these questions start coming about for you was this when you were doing sort of your bachelor's your master's your, your phd when did you start really sort of narrowing your focus not narrowing your focus but you know really sort of focusing on on the gender differences on women and and realizing that we you know women are not small men um i really started asking the questions my second year of undergrad uh, when i was doing my bachelor's and i gave a ted talk recently and opened it up kind of with the same story where I remember distinctively being in a metabolism lab um, and running for two hours on the treadmill. We had to run on the treadmill for two hours one week and do the exact same thing the following week. Um, Looking at fuel use, like trying to see if taking water or carbohydrate would help with fuel utilization. And like the first week, I was great. I kept pace, didn't feel tired, ran a whole two hours just on water. And then the following week was the exact same protocol, and I, like, fell flat. I was like, I don't even think I can run for a half an hour. And then when we started looking at the results, the two guys had the same, like, carbohydrate, fat utilization profile both weeks. But me, it was completely different. The first week, I was able to primarily use carbohydrate and a little bit of fat. And then the following week, it was primarily fatty acids and I couldn't hit intensities. And retrospectively, you know, a year or so later, going back after I was told, well, you're just an anomaly going, wait a second. I was in the high hormone phase for, of my menstrual cycle for the second trial. I was in the low hormone phase for the first trial. Maybe that has something to do with it. And for the fact that the person or the professor is running the lab told me, oh, you're an anomaly. And then my question was, well, why am I an anomaly? And he said, well, you know, we don't do a lot of studies on women because they're too hard to study. So we end up doing all of our studies on men. And with that eye-opening statement, going through the rest of my undergraduate classes and being told all this data in nutrition and metabolism and biomechanics, and then asking, what about women? They're like, what do you mean, what about women? This is, this is what it is, and never really getting that answer. So then when I went to my master's, I was specifically looking at female runners and, and overtraining and how that was different between menstrual cycle phases and how that might differ from men. And then when I went into my PhD, same thing, looking at fluid balance and the heat and what's different between men and women and menstrual cycle and OCP. So yeah, really trying to dig in as I started having questions as an athlete, trying to answer those questions for myself, but also for everybody else around me. When you talk about that, it almost, it just seems so obvious, but I'm, I'm actually filled with rage, just like, oh my God, like, just the fact that women, the, women are just called an anomaly, and it, we should just accept that, you know, the research and what's gone on before, and for you to actually start going, oh, hold on, let's ask these questions, let's figure out what are the differences, what is happening, and I think one of the really interesting things that you, you mentioned there was the menstrual cycle, which is something... I think even over the past 20 years, it was just something that that women just didn't talk about. It was like an, an embarrassment. And it's only now that people, like it started to come up, you know, like when Paula Radcliffe talked about having um, her period in the Chicago Marathon or uh, there was a tennis player who thought, oh, you know, it's, it's that time of the month. And um, it's and actually recently with the, with the World Cup women's soccer team and how they, what they did with regards to, to periods and training. Could you share sure. more ab- about the menstrual cycle? Because I know I know a lot of us have studied it when we did biology, when we or sex. I was going to say sex ed classes. That sounds very American. I can't remember what we had in the UK. Um, <laughs> but could you just share just what what do we need to know as women about the menstrual cycle? Yeah. So if we think about it as a textbook, like this might invoke some image memories. Um, but textbook wise, we say that day one is the first day of bleeding up to around day 12 or 13, which is ovulation with an upsurge of just estrogen. And then estrogen sort of tapers down as you enter the beginning of the high hormone phase. And then estrogen and progesterone both start to rise. We call that the luteal phase. And that lasts to about day 27, 28, when there's an inflammation response that causes the hormones to plummet and your period starts again. So in general, we say that a a normal cycle is between 28 and 34 days, sometimes stretches out to 40 in athletes. But if you go more than 40 days without um, a cycle, then you're technically having menstrual dysfunction or irregularity. 
Um, so when we talk about the phases, the low hormone phase is the follicular phase, and then the high hormone phase is the luteal phase with ovulation separating them. So almost break it down. So in those, in those first sort of uh, 12, 13 days, the low hormone phase, what should the focus be or what should women be aware of during, you know, almost during that, that period of low hormone? And then what should they be focused on during like that high period of hormones? The way I, I do the elevator pitch is everything you know about sport nutrition and exercise and training is applicable for the first about 10 days of your cycle when your hormones are low and we are more like men. So you can hit the power hard. You can do a couple of days of intensity um, without having too many ramifications. You can recover well. Uh, you can sleep well. Your core temperature is lower. You're hydrated well. Your core or your heat tolerance is a bit higher than if you were in the high hormone phase. And then around ovulation, this becomes really individual because some women feel bulletproof and other women have a couple of days of feeling really flat. So if you're having a flat day, just know that that's because of the way estrogen affects your brain, affects other systems in the body. And just take it easy. Don't beat yourself up. But if you're a woman who feels bulletproof, go and hit it really hard. Like Get that top-end training stress so that you can adapt to that training stress because then you're working with your physiology to get that extra bit out of training that you ordinarily wouldn't be able to because you'll recover well and estrogen in itself is anabolic. And then when we get to estrogen and progesterone starting to rise in the early luteal phase or the early part of the high hormone phase, this is more a little bit of steady state threshold work because you're not going to hit that really top end high intensity without doing some specific nutrition interventions. And then when you get into the about five to seven days before your period starts or the late luteal phase where estrogen and progesterone are the highest. This is where we are most different from men. Our core temperature is elevated. We've lost around 8% of the water from our blood. We're more predisposed to essential nervous system fatigue, the way estrogen interferes with tryptophan and leucine in the brain. Progesterone is catabolic, so we have a really difficult time recovering, and our, our muscles are in a constant state of breakdown. And then we also kick out more total body sodium. So we know these things and are aware of these things. And when we realize that and have patterning against our training, then we can put in specific interventions to be able to hit the top end bits that we want to and not be compromised. Because there's so many people that go through and say, oh, it's a few days before my period starts. I can't race. I can't do this. I can't do that. And I'm like, no. Your period is never an excuse. PMT is never an excuse. It's you being aware of it and how you feel and then we take a step back and say, okay, well, we know that the body uses more magnesium, so we need to increase your magnesium. You have really bad cramping? Well, let's counter that inflammation response by putting in more omega-3s and maybe baby aspirin. You're having lots of central nervous system fatigue? Well, we know that estrogen interferes with tryptophan, and if you take in branched-chain amino acids, then that's going to kick out some of the estrogen and attach to this those receptor sites so that you can get your mojo back. So there are specific interventions you can do to maximize everything across the whole cycle. When did you start tracking your period? Oh, you know, I don't even think my husband knows this, but I started tracking it because I didn't want to get pregnant <laughs> a long time ago. So I'd say, oh, maybe 15 years ago. It first came to my attention that you should be doing it when there were no real ways of, of measuring, like when you, when I was doing a master's degree and trying to figure out phases, unless you had a blood test, which was really expensive, there were no home ovulation predictor kits or anything like that. So you had to track basal temperature. And so I was, I'm always a, a pilot subject in all my studies. So I started doing that. And then it clicked. It's like, well, you can track and figure out your phases this way. So then I was able to figure out where I would be and just kept like a little note on the calendar. But then for really tracking against training, I started that when I was racing bikes for Tipco, I'd say 2008, 2009. So it's been a while. Yeah. So I'd love to go back to that time back in like 2008, 2009 when so you were racing bikes. Tell us more about what was happening athletically. And also you mentioned that you're like a, a pilot study. You, you're like the first person that you're testing this stuff out. Could you sort of talk, take us back to that time, like 
figuring it out, what you were trialing, how it was working and, and what you were learning at that point? Yeah, so if we go back to when I was doing my master's and trying to figure out like the basal temperature and being a pilot subject, I don't want to put any of my participants through something that I don't know what they're feeling. Um, Because when you're pushing people to their limits, you really have to have that empathy. You have to know exactly what they're feeling, when to push them, when to back it off, when to help them out, and know that what you're putting your participant through is an undue burden. And so when you're looking at designing a study, you want to make it uh, feasible scientifically, but also not so hard that your participants drop out. That's why I'm always a participant in my own studies. So when I'm tracking back then basal metabolic rate and taking your temperature every morning, the old school fertility method, um, I was also rowing and running and starting to get a little bit into triathlon. And there were days where I'd feel absolutely flat and I could track that against core temperature and be like, hey, wait, my core temperature is coming up. What does that mean? So I really started seeing those patterns and being able to say, oh, yeah, well, tomorrow I'm going to have a really crappy day when I go for a run. Maybe I won't go for a run. And then that just kind of carried over. And it became something that was just, you know, a habit where I put a mark on the calendar going, oh, this is when my period's supposed to come. So if I was starting to feel you know, tired, lethargic, then I could be like, oh, my period's coming in four or five days. So I better start doing some things to to mitigate this. So I know it's not my fitness. It's actually my physiology and hormones that are making me feel like this. And then when I was racing um, at the high level and on the national race calendar circuit, um, having a lot of the women I was racing with also knew that I was involved in the men's peloton. Um, not as an athlete, but as a sports scientist. So they were asking me questions about what I was doing with the men. And I was like, you know what? This isn't applicable to us as women. So I started educating my teammates about tracking their cycle and how to eat and not getting into too much of a carbohydrate depletion. And when you start bonding that way, then talking about your periods and what's happening, what's not happening becomes commonplace. And that was the goal as teammates to make everything commonplace. And then when you get out and realize that it's not commonplace, that starts a wider conversation. Um, And so that was the push now, you know, going, going into the wider conversations, getting men and women to say the word period without blushing, especially coaches. So when you have apps like fitter woman coming out or that's not a fertility app, like hello clue, it's great because it just opens up that conversation door. So more and more people are comfortable talking about having their period or not having their period, which is a warning sign. Coaches know how to broach it, even though it's a little bit uncomfortable, And it just opens a whole range of possibilities for women to dial in their training and nutrition so much more. It's fascinating. And one area which I think is is, uh, really interesting is, is I know that when I've, when I've been training and sometimes I just, you know, I just haven't been, haven't been able to, to, to do what I expected to do. And I feel as though like I've lost all my strength and, you know, you feel flat, you feel a bit like, oh, and mentally I'm actually blaming myself. I'm like, what? What what am I doing wrong? Why can't I do what I was doing like the other day? And sometimes you just well, I never really can until I read your book and listened to you on another podcast. I never connected it to my periods. It's just something that I didn't even think about. It just wasn't. It was just something that you just dealt with, you know, every single month. So I'm just wondering, you know, God, there must be so many women out there who aren't aware, don't realize this because it isn't it's not common or not that common knowledge yet. And also what the, the mental impact is it, of it is. Oh, yeah, it's huge. It's huge. It's crazy. Like you have people come in and, you know, or you hear passing conversation. Oh, you know, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but, uh, you know, I absolutely sucked at CrossFit today. I couldn't hit this. And I don't think I'm going to go back to boot camp tomorrow because I don't know what's going on. I must not be sleeping well or, you know, I'm highly stressed. And it's like, well, actually... Yeah, you know, I'm I'm one of the American in a quiet quiet population. I'm like, well, actually, do you know what what phase you are in your period? And people's faces like turn bright red. And I was like, you need to think about that <laughs> because I don't want people to have that negative connotation that it's their fault because it's not. It's not your fitness. It's not your motivation. It's not your application. It's the way that these sex hormones affect every system in the body. Yeah. But but I think even if you if you if somebody had said to me like a couple of weeks ago, it's like oh you know do you know where where you are in your cycle? I'd just be like no. Do you, what do you what do you know about your cycle? 
nothing like I don't I'm don't even try like I don't really I don't track it like I just it's just sort of like it's just like a surprise <laughs> it sounds all about <laughs> not even a nice surprise not a very good surprise yeah I have to say yeah. oh just yeah like, oh it happens oh okay oh oh I've oh that's why I wanted all that chocolate and that's why I was a bit moody oh okay yeah that's figuring it out for you what were they like the the really eye-opening moments in your career when you were suddenly like bingo or like oh my god this is just like amazing and epic you know, I don't think I've ever had any like one definitive or two definitive moments. I've just rolled with the punches because being in a male dominated industry, both sport and medicine, you just get knocked down so much. And I always had the idea that you need to say something to be heard so that you're not just the token woman in the room. And the more you push and the more uncomfortable the person might be, then you know that you're hitting something that you need to investigate. And my mom will be like, this is not the daughter I knew when she was little, because I was like this quiet, little shy person that never did anything, never asked questions that were out of the scope of what was normal. But when it came to me that women were being marginalized in research. I was like, this is just not right. It's not about me. It's about over half the population. And when you get to the history of women, the marginalization of women and like women in sport, history of sport, we've all been marginalized as just over half the population because it's been such a patriarchal um, conversation about it, patriarchal rules about it. And it just gets to me, it gets me so mad. And I think that anger is just fostered into pushing and pushing and pushing and challenging the dogma. And now it's like, what's what's next? What's next? It's like I pushed in the sports industry to create drinks and things that were appropriate for physiology. Now I'm pushing in nutrition industry to look at sustainable ways of creating vegan proteins and looking at menopause and saying, we don't need to be put on hormones if we can use nutrition and adaptogens to help our body understand what's going on as our hormones flatline. But it's not in a normal conversation. So people kind of take a step back and go, wait, you're outside the box. We don't like that. And for me, it's not being outside the box. It's just trying to get these questions answered because it makes me mad that they're not answered. Yeah. How do you deal with sort of the setbacks and the pushbacks or people not listening to you or or, or just feel as though sometimes you're hitting brick wall after brick wall after brick wall? Oh, I've had my share of PTSD about it. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Um, you, you know, when you encounter people that are, are very hardcore and won't change their opinion, won't have an alternate viewpoint, then it's not necessarily giving up. It's just trying to understand their viewpoint and talk their language. Um, I still have people come up to me and say, why do you want to study women? We don't know enough about men. Why do you want to study the menstrual cycle? It causes so many issues in research. And I just kind of look at them and go, okay, take a step back, 1960s, 1960 mentality, and then be like, well, you know, because these are the questions I need to have answered for the people that I work with the most. Or this is a hole in the research that needs to be answered. And we can see it in the literature that these questions haven't been answered. So it's novel research. And that's if I'm talking to, um, you know, academics and researchers. If I'm talking to medical scope, it's hard when you're getting into like orthopedics or something where you know there's that, that hard line um, boy, boy club and, and, and that really siloed vision. So it's, again, reading the individual and trying to figure out which direction can you come in and try to see their viewpoint so they understand yours. It's taken a very long time to be able to do that. And if I were to go back to my 20-year-old self and be like, I know you're really angry and pissed off at these answers and no one's listening to you, but just understand where they're coming from and the history behind it, and soon it'll just evolve. It's It's really taking yourself out of where you are in your box to see how they are viewing you and what their history is. Tell us more about the book Raw and where the idea came from and and how you ended up writing it. So when I was um, launching 
the women's line for Osmo, um, I had Celine Yeager come to a camp to trial it and talk about it. And um, she was like, well, how come we don't know all this stuff about women? And I was like, because it's really hard to get it out there in mainstream media and people don't want to listen because it's all male focused. So she you know, started writing more and more articles, women focused. And then remember, she emailed me Christmas time going, I have this great idea. Let's pitch a book to Rodell and see if they take it. So she pitched it and they're like, we love this idea. And so I created a Dropbox of different files and notes and PDFs and she would write the lay person terminology and I'd go in and put in more of the scientific stuff. And so, yeah, it just came out of a conversation of women need to know this and having someone who had the platform to make it happen. It was like everything kind of lined up and it wasn't my intention to write a book, but when the opportunity came up and Celine is really well known for all of her books and her, um, feature articles and such across mainstream media. It's like, this is an opportunity you can't refuse. Yeah. And the book's been out for three years. So it's, it's interesting that it's just now getting so much attention and traction three years later, just tells you how much information is not out there. Yeah. Why do you think it started to get more traction over the past sort of couple of years? I think there's a combination of things like there's more people, sports women who are taking a front and stepping out and saying, I'm not a guy. And these are some of the issues I have with red S, with periods, with being a mom. Um, the globalization of information helps too. And social media, like social media, social media influencers, it just makes everything just exponentially go faster. And part of my, I guess, backstop was not being that involved in social media just from a time standpoint but people started talking about it and so when I was like wait I really need to get someone to help me get this out here then more and more of that information got out and it's just started taking off yeah I, I think it's fascinating because some I'm a, I think social media is it, it, there's you know obviously it, it bounces out but I think it's it's amazing for if, if women aren't getting the exposure in mainstream media, then social media is where you need to be, whether that's running your own podcast, running your own blogs, creating your own YouTube channel, writing your books. If you can't get them published, you write ebooks. You know, there's powerful ways now of getting your story out there or other people's stories out there and, and communicating this message. And, and sometimes I do feel there's this like underground swell of like this information being shared exactly like your, exactly like your, your book. And then people hear about it on different podcasts. They read about it. They tell their friends and it just helps women to start to understand their own bodies so much better. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff covered, um, covered in the book I find it absolutely fascinating reading and I there's a couple of things that I'd love to go into into a little bit more detail especially with regards to nutrition and the one thing that really shocked me and um was about keto I'm a big believer in go it or going like low carb high fat high protein and um and trying to trying to get into ketosis and Whereas you you don't really suggest suggest that for women. I'd love to hear more about your thoughts around this and how this came about and what you've learned from that aspect of things. I mean, there's a couple of different tiers that come into it and research coming out about it now too. When we look at the idea of being in ketosis and you look at the seminal research behind it, like why did this evolve? Why did it become a, a thing for people to do? And it originated in a male population that was obese diabetic and had to lose weight quickly for surgery. And then the other population that has been studied and works really well is epileptic children. So the issue there is you have such great success in these populations and it gets put out in like JAM will publish an article and New York Times will pick it up. The Be Well um, uh, you know, column in New York Times will pick it up and then it gets transferred into the fitness industry. And so then again, you get a couple of people that it works for and you get this groundswell. Here's this fantastic new diet. It works great, but the research doesn't support it. So then when you look specifically at the population that it affects the most in a negative sense, it's women. And we look and most of the women that are having issues, sure, for the first three or so months, they might thrive on it. But when you start looking at cortisol levels, menstrual cycle dysfunction, abdominal adiposity, 
all of these come into play. And it has to do with the fact that women need more carbohydrate just to exist than men. We have an endocrine system that relies on carbohydrate plus our brain, where men don't have a menstrual cycle. They're not building tissue and losing it every month. They're not having um, the signal for thyroid to regulate that plus its own its own body. So when you start reducing carbohydrates to that ketotic state, you're really compromising total health. When we're thinking about trying to lose weight and maintain health for performance, in the short term, it can work, and I've seen it work. But in the longer term, six months down the line, you start seeing thyroid dysfunction, which is a down regulation of your resting metabolic rate, and it's really difficult to raise it again. You also have a, a higher incidence of cardiometabolic problems that come down the line. And now the longitudinal research is coming out that in both sexes, there's an increase in cardiovascular risk factors with long-term ketotic diets. And when you think from the, the large view of what happens from a, like a physiological and biological, um, you know, going back to the hunter-gatherer days, it was appropriate for times of low carbohydrate and low calorie where men would lean up and get fit and get fast because they had to go out and fight to find the food. But the women weren't in that. They weren't going out to fight the food. They were at home or in the tent or at the tribe taking care of the kids. But at the same time, because there was such a low carbohydrate and calorie availability, it was not advantageous to reproduce to create another mouth to feed. So you get menstrual cycle dysfunction and amenorrhea and abdominal adiposity and more body fat storage to feed the woman and who would get the calories last. So it's a biological process. And now when we look scientifically and you look at how all of the research has come out and been disseminated into the fitness world, it doesn't make sense. There's no evidence to show that it is beneficial for women, but there's more evidence to show that it's not. Oh, God, it's absolutely fascinating. (laughs) Doing what you do, what do you think are the key things that, that women need to know that maybe women don't know at this point in time? I know that sounds like a really general question, but, um, but, but what, are the, what are the specific things that women who are out training, who are athletes, need to be aware of? Or what are the biggest mistakes that, that we're making currently at the moment? Aside not tracking your menstrual cycle, because that's the biggest thing to tell you if things are going right or wrong. I'd say that's the biggest thing. Like women aren't tracking their cycle or they're amenorrheic and they think that that's fine. And we know that having your period is an ergogenic aid. Like you have your period, then you know that you're, you're healthy. If you're healthy then and a healthy athlete, then your performance keeps going up because there's fantastic evidence coming out to show that women who are amenorrheic or what we ha- say have ovulation suppression, they'll get into a training program and they might be in the same training program as women who are not amenorrheic. And they do the same type of training, but over the course of a 12-week training block, those women who are amenorrheic, their performance just takes a a downward negative dive, and the resting metabolic rate just keeps going down and down and down and down because their body's trying to conserve and conserve and conserve. So when we look at not having your period, which is, you know, a mentality that so many women have, I'm training hard enough, I've lost my period. That's something that we shouldn't think. If we don't have a period, something's wrong. If you start getting menstrual cycle dysfunction, then have a look at your training and be like, oh, wait, I'm not fueling well enough for my training, getting into low energy availability. I'm not having enough carbohydrate to support the intensity that I've ramped up. So when you start having that menstrual cycle irregularity, that's the key to go back and be like, hey, wait a second, what's going on? And then you can have a really good look and be like, oh, wait, maybe I have a little bit of low energy availability. I'm not fueling specifically for my training because I'm trying to lose weight. And then you get into the whole thing where um, women and some men, too, you don't eat enough. So your performance starts to go down. And so you think that you're too heavy. So then you cut your calories, which causes like this downward spiral putting on body fat you cut your calories trying to lose the body fat the body keeps putting it on so it becomes this big you know round circle that that can be prevented Stacey, I'd love to ask you about recovery and what are the best things that women can be doing to help them recover after they've had like an intense training session or, you know, worked really hard in the gym or been out cycling or running. What are some of the key things that, that women need to be doing? 
So really paying attention to their protein after exercise, because we have a shorter window of recovery than men. And we also go through, um, well, with progesterone, it's catabolic, but um, our ability to recover is is different from men from a sex difference standpoint. So I always tell women, like, focus on getting your 25 to 30 grams of protein within 30 minutes. And then that opens up the window for a real meal to pull in your carbohydrate afterwards. But if you skip that, then you come down to baseline a lot faster and you can't really recover well. And a lot of times women who do high intensity or it's a hot run and they're not used to it, their appetite's completely muted after training. They just can't eat anything. So this is where if you're like, okay, well, I'm not hungry. I don't want to have anything. Having a watery protein shake is great because you're going to get that protein in and you're also going to help rehydrate and bring your core temperature down. So then that facilitates recovery. Because recovery is is so critical for those adaptations, recovery and sleep. And if we compromise on both of those, then that 6 a.m. interval set that you did, it was, you should have just stayed in bed because you're not going to adapt to it. Have you been? Have you been? I I know you just um, had a hip operation, but before that, were you training for anything? How does exercise still play a role in in your life? So what are you out and about doing? Um, I'm still trying to find my way. No, uh, when we after I had my daughter I had hip issues with the other side so I didn't really get back into anything I found out I was pregnant with her the weekend before I raced Xterra Worlds and the idea after I had her was to get into more trail running because I live by the trails but that didn't happen um so I got more into mountain biking and um ocean swimming and then when we moved to New Zealand since I'd been away for 17 years I decided to do every local race that was here at Mount Monganui so it was like a half marathon up and down the mount um, and doing the Olympic distance try and the half Ironman and the 15K trail run and all that kind of stuff. But I never really found my groove. I was like, mm, I don't want to race bikes because the roads here are awful and it's not quite the type of racing that I wanted to do. Mountain bike trails a little bit too far away. Running, yeah, and then I started getting hurt. So I don't know. I dabble in everything. I love ocean swimming. I love a little bit of CrossFit. I love yoga. I love running, cycling, all those kinds of things. So now it's just doing something every day just to stay happy. What what sort of exercise were you doing while you were pregnant? Oh, so I was an anomaly there. I'll I'll say that with not really um, an eye to the guys that told me that women are anomalies, but I had a really hard pregnancy where the only time I could eat anything is when I was moving. So I kept swimming and running and cycling. And I remember the day before I had my daughter, I was out on my road bike riding. And this guy's like, whoa, you're really pregnant. I was like, that's okay. I'm going to have her tomorrow because I was going to be induced. But then my water broke and I had a natural birth. So, yeah, I was out doing something every day. And it isn't that you pick up something new when you're pregnant. It's if you keep doing what you have been doing, your body's going to tell you what you can do. Like you can't go anaerobic when you're pregnant. There are certain stretches and things that you can't do because it just feels off. So if you're intuitive and you listen to your body, it's better to just keep doing what you're doing within reason and um, just stay active and fit all the way through. How did it change for you after after having your after having your child? Oh, uh, everything <laughs> changed. Uh, um, so when she was three months old, well, actually, the month before I had her, I launched a, a startup company, and I went on maternity leave and changed careers, and we moved north. So everything you're not supposed to do, we did. And then I had her and was like, well, I don't know what to do. My whole life is different. So I was trying to find my ways. Um, And so you learn to juggle, right? You don't go out for five-hour rides because you don't have five hours. You're like, I have an hour and a half before the baby wakes up. I'm going to go run this hill or I'm going to go ride this hill or maybe I'm just going to have quiet time. So you learn to work and groove and try to find those own pockets of time where you have to yourself to take care of yourself. Because if you take care of yourself, then you're better for your kid and your family. And I'm still trying to find my way six years later going, well, 
you know, I know that I have to get her to school at this time and I'm tired. And, but if I don't get up to go to swim squad, then I won't be able to do anything for the day. Cause then I have to go to work and life's completely different. And it's interesting when you encounter people who don't have kids and they're empathetic to all the challenges. But then when they do have kids, they're like, holy shit, now I understand. So your life is completely different. My life is completely different, even though I still try to maintain some semblance of the old life. What are you studying at the moment? What are you working on? Um, I have a few different studies going. Uh, One is uh, nootrophics and... um, sustainable seaweed project that I'm working with marine sciences um, looking at seaweed and, and microalgae to harness some of the things that seaweed can do from an adaptation point of view and then looking at dose response for period and postmenopausal women after downhill running because we know that the typical 20 gram dose doesn't even touch that catabolic state but we found 35 to 40 grams works I'm looking, working on a longitudinal study with rugby sevens and Olympic weightlifting, trying to track menstrual cycle and keep them out of low energy availability. So that one's interesting. And then I have a new PhD student starting that we're going to start looking at um, different types of protein and dosage for different teens and sexes. So there's a lot rolling. It's just trying to find the time of the day to make it all work. How do you how do you sort of balance everything in your life? Because you you know you're a mother, you you've got your entrepreneurial business side of things. You're you know you're an academic. You're you're working in the university. How how do you balance that all out? I have a very understanding husband, who we are very much in the co-parenting, and he travels for work. I travel for work, so we just kind of have to mesh all of our schedules because our kid comes first, and then everything else kind of comes second. And I always feel like I'm never doing anything a hundred percent because I can't, but I try as best as I can. And there are lots of times where I'm like, I just can't do it. I need to, I'm, I'm going to crack. So, you know, it's interesting when you look forward to surgery to have a break, but that's kind of how it was rolling this year. And then after two weeks, I was like, Oh, I can't, I've, I've got so much to do. I've, I've got to get back into it. But balance is interesting because if I'm not on the go all the time, then I feel not so great. Like I always need to be thinking and moving and and working, not necessarily from like an entrepreneurial and academic work, like working with my kid and playing with her and helping with her homework or doing some kind of creative craft or going out with my husband. You know, so you have all those kind of things that are all induce some sort of stress. But I think I'm somewhat addicted to that being type a minus personality that if I were to sit and have that parasympathetic response of doing nothing I don't think it would it would jive very well okay Stacey I'm going to mix things up a little bit now so I've got some quick fire questions for you my questions may be quick fire but your answers don't necessarily have to be quick fire and then after the quick fire questions I'll ask you for some final words of advice and top tips and then we'll find out the best place to uh, follow uh, with your journey and get your book how does that sound Perfect. Okay. Okay. Are you a morning or evening person? Morning. Definitely. What time does your alarm go off? Um, anywhere between 10 past five and six o'clock. Tea or coffee? Coffee. What book are you currently reading at the moment? Oh, I'll walk over and see. Um, cause I have this tendency to read like spy novels and stuff, but right now I am reading Karen Slaughter's The Last Widow. Is it good? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, it's one of those that it doesn't have anything to do with academia, doesn't have anything to do with science, so I can just get lost in some story before I fall asleep. Awesome. What's your favorite movie or film? Oh, I don't know if I have one. Um, well, yeah, you- I don't. <laughs> do, you, do you have? Ne- do you, are you are you, um, are you like on Amazon Prime or do you have Netflix or anything? Yeah, but my husband tends to dominate the remote, so I never really get a choice. <laughs> so you would would you ever sit and like binge watch a whole series? Oh, uh, yeah. So Stranger Things, I've done that, and Sugar Rush, which I don't like. They're you know one's like teeny bopper kind of stuff, and the other is all about cupcakes and cakes because the sculpting that they do with it is really cool. <laughs> 
I love it. What about music? Do you have like a particular genre or type of music that you listen to? I'm a bit of a music snob. Um, it's more stuff I don't listen to because uh, I grew up in a house of Boss Nova as well as things like Diana Ross and Supremes and The Doors, so a very eclectic group. But I really cannot stand country music. Just I can't do it. Can't do it. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Do you train with music? Sometimes, yep. But more and more, no, because where I work is right that we share a wall with a high performance gym and there's really bad like clubby music all day every day so now if I go out I just want nothing what is your favorite piece of kit or gear my bike I say that because it's not about the bike it's where it takes you and who I've met I've met my best friend I've met my husband I've had so many different experiences met some of the best people that I could have ever encountered and connections all about riding bicycles. Did, did your bike have a name? It's nicknamed Slinky Malinky from the Harry McClary stories. What about rest and recovery? What do you do for rest and recovery? Uh, I go to the hot pools or I go for an ocean swim, um, like just a floaty swim in my wetsuit, and sleep. What time do you go to bed? About 10. Are you a mountain or beach person? Beach. In terms of food, what is your favorite type of food to eat on the bike and your favorite type of food like in normal life? So on the bike, I like this combination of my kids' maple crunchy cereal (laughs) and these freeze-dried strawberries and walnuts. Um, It's kind of like that salty sweet mix. And then in normal life, I guess in the States they call them Buddha bowls where it's a big mix of different greens and and veggies and grains with different interesting vegetables that you put on top. And each time you get something like that, it's different. Oh, I love it. It sounds amazing. So Stacey, final words of advice and wisdom for the women listening that you would just like to share with them. I think the biggest thing is not taking someone's like advice on how things work for them from a nutrition and training standpoint because you'll have coaches say well this worked for so and so and this worked for me so it should work for you but really look at the information you're being given and say is this appropriate for me for where I am in my life my body type Um, is it what I want to do and if that's in the too hard basket then I'm just going to come right back down and say women aren't small men and you should definitely track your cycle absolutely and especially I think it's so true with the food food and um, nutrition and training because it's going to be so easy to look at what other people are doing and think oh I'll definitely give that a go I think that's amazing you know try different things but I think you've got to almost be like a magpie and just pick and choose what works for you trial it out and see what agrees with your stomach when you're out training like what yeah Work, work it out for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, women are not small men, so stop eating and training like one. And where's the best place for people to find more information out about you? To are, are you are, are you active on social media or not really? Or what's the where's the best place for them to go? Yeah, so we post something new every day on Insta, Twitter, and Facebook under the Doctor Stacy Sims handle, and that's the best place to get a hold of me and keep track of everything that I'm doing. Excellent. Any plans for another book? Yep, there's one in the works, and um, hopefully we'll get it out by the end of of the summer. Northern Hemisphere. No, I should say Southern Hemisphere summer. Oh, I'm trying to work that out. So that would be like March next year, then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! Do you know what the title is? Can you tell anything? anything? Can you tell us anything about it? Uh, we have a working title, but basically it is roar for the peri and postmenopausal woman. Wow, that's going to be awesome. Oh, my God, I'm excited yeah. about that. Because actually that menopause, yeah. yeah, menopause is something that actually I've noticed on, on Twitter. I'm, I'm following these people. I can't remember what the handle is, but it's all about like menopause and the, the fact that it's not discussed enough. Doctors aren't really even aware of it. And there's so much like. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. There's a little bit out there for like the pre-menopausal woman, but then when you get to menopause, it's like tumbleweeds. No one wants it. They're like, it's the change. It's like, what do you mean the change? Still the same person. There's just a difference in hormones and we need to talk about this. So 
Absolutely. Oh, well, Stacey, a massive thank you for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share more about your own personal journey and also what you're doing for other women out there. Um, I highly do recommend that everyone should go and buy the book Raw, and I'll, I'll obviously tell people more about it. But yeah, thank you just so much for being so open and honest and, and sharing what you've shared. It is so it's so fascinating. I love what you're doing, and thank you for thank you for your study and and writing books about it and, and putting this information out there. I really do appreciate it. Thanks, thanks. And the best thing to do is just keep spreading the word. The more people that know about it, and the more it becomes commonplace conversation, the better we all are. Absolutely, a hundred percent. Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Dr. Stacey Sims. What an incredible woman. I love the research that she is doing. It is so, so powerful. If you haven't read it already, or if you're thinking of buying the book Raw, please do go and buy it. I got my my copy a couple of weeks ago. I've already read it through once. I'm going to be going through it a second time with a highlighter to reread it and to make sure that I'm aware of everything that she has been talking about. So the book is called Raw, How to Match Your Food and Fitness to Your Female Physiology for Optimum Performance. Great health and a strong lean body for life. I've got a couple of other recommendations for you. I'd really encourage you to go and take a listen to um, Jen Brown's Sparta Chicks Radio. Jen spoke with Dr. Stacey Sims on March 24th earlier on this year. The episode is evergreen. It's well worth listening to now. It's Dr. Stacey Sims on how to work with your body, not fight against it. She covers off a lot of great topics and I think it's really, really complimentary to what we've talked about. I'll just share a little bit more of um, of what Jen, Jen wrote about it. At the core of Stacey's work is the concept that women are not small men. It seems obvious, I know. However, the majority of sports science research and as a result, the majority of what we understand about the best way to train, eat, drink, race and recover has been done on men. Even the common training program structures of three weeks of training followed by one week of recovery is, you guessed it, based on research done on men, without any regard for the hormonal changes experienced by women each and every month. Yet given that every system in our body changes across the month, not just our hormones, it's hard and frustrating to believe this shrink it and pink it approach has also been applied to sports science. But unfortunately, it has. We've been taught to train, eat, drink, race and recover the same way as men. Um, Jane goes on to say she honestly believes and she started telling everybody and everyone who will listen to her that Stacey's book is required reading for all women as well as for anyone who works with women, coaches, personal trainers, group fitness instructors, Pilates instructors, yoga instructors, physios, massage therapists, etc. And I completely agree with Jen. So please do go take a listen to that episode. It's episode number 99. It was reached on March 24th. And if you like the Tough Girl podcast, you'll really like Spider Chicks Radio as well. Well worth listening to. Go and check out the website, spiderchicks.com. The other episode that I like to recommend to you is an episode that I did with Rennie McGregor, who is a dietitian, and it's well worth listening to, especially if you are having problems with your period in terms of that you're not getting it and you should be having a period, then please do go take a listen to Dr. Rennie McGregor. Really, really fascinating stuff. But everything that we've talked about with Stacey will be in the show notes, available at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go check out the website, check out the show notes, see all the other women that I've interviewed over the past four years. There's over 200 episodes. So I just want to say a massive thank you to all my patrons and supporters for signing up and supporting the podcast it allows me to produce content like this just want to say a massive thank you to julia clark for signing up as a patron thank you so much for coming on board thank you so much for for supporting the work that I do and contributing financially every single month. It makes such a big difference. If you want to support the Tough Girl podcast, then please do go check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. My mission is to share information like this. My mission is to increase the amount of female role models in the media. If you want to be part of that mission, sign up as a patron. If you've been motivated by the Tough Girl podcast, sign up as a patron. If you've been inspired by the Tough Girl podcast, sign up as a patron. If you want to spread this message, if you want to increase the amount of female role models in the media, sign up as a patron. $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, $25 a month. Patreon.com forward slash tough girl podcast. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, have an awesome day. Give it your all. Give it 110%. Get after it. Go after your dreams. Start today. Take that first step. You are the only person who can make your dreams happen. And I believe in you. Please believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. You can do it. Go for it. All right. Take care. Lots of love. And I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl Podcast. Lots of love. Bye.